Hi class, uh, welcome to the second half of lecture for the day. So we're gonna spend a little time cruising through the solar system talking about the planets and whether or not they are likely places for us to find life. Now we should say at the outset that if we look at our criteria that we think are essential for life, there is really nowhere in the solar system where we are absolutely certain we think it's likely we should find life. Everything is highly speculative at this point. And that's largely because uh, our biases, which inform that list of things uh, that we think are necessary for life, um, come from the way the Earth is. And there is no other place in the solar system that is quite like Earth. Okay, so in the uh, background here, uh, this is an artist's rendition of what Mars would look like if we added water to Mars and flooded the lowlands of Mars. So Mars has topography just like the Earth, and there are definitely low places and definitely high places. And so if you were to imagine filling in the low places, uh, then Mars would have oceans uh, and land masses not unlike the Earth. And so just the addition of water to Mars um, makes it look more Earth-like. And indeed, for those of you who kind of uh, pay attention to this, the idea of trying to transform Mars, terraform Mars, as it were, um, into an environment where you and I could exist without spacesuits, for instance, um, is largely driven by this fact that if you could add an ocean, the environment is such that uh, Mars might become more Earth-like in nature. Okay, and we'll talk about that more. We're gonna spend a whole week talking about Mars and we'll talk about that uh, in a little while. But bear that in mind as we go through our tour of the solar system here today. Okay, so let me start a couple of slides here. So most of you have probably had uh, some exposure. If you've had any astronomy at all before, uh, you've probably done a tour of the solar system. Let's uh, go through it quickly. Um, you may hear some things that you know about. I'll show you some pretty pictures, uh, but I wanna focus on those properties of the uh, planets that may or may not influence whether or not we could find life there. And so we'll talk about each one of those in turn, um, and then we'll uh, use that as our starting point. Uh, uh, to talk about life and uh, moons next time. Okay, so we'll do the encyclopedia entries, which will consist of a whole bunch of basic uh, facts and cool things about the planets. We'll talk about how those facts and cool things about the planets may influence the prospects for life. And then I will give a speculation on my part about what I think the prospects for life on each of the planets are. Okay, and so what I would encourage you to do is to keep your own tabulated uh, list of what you think the prospects are. Okay, so one reason to think about doing that is to imagine you were, uh, you know, the director of NASA and you had to decide where to spend the, send the space probe to start searching for life. You want to have a good sense of what you think the good places to look in the solar system are. Okay. So I'll remind you that the solar system is divided up into these three zones. So we're talking about the terrestrial worlds, we'll talk about the Jovian worlds, and then we'll uh, mention Pluto at the end. So the, the world closest to the sun is Mercury. Now, those of you who know something about the solar system uh, knew that if I put up a picture of Mercury and a picture of the moon right next to each other, they would look extraordinarily similar. They are both rocky gray worlds. They are both heavily cratered, um, meaning that their surfaces have not changed much since the early time of the solar system, other than to just be blasted smithereens by things hitting them, okay? Now, because Mercury is close to the sun, it has a lot of very interesting properties. So I'll point to the table up there in the upper left to start with. Um, note the rotation period. Okay, so Mercury rotates very, very slowly. It takes 1400 hours to complete one rotation. Okay, and so what that means is the days on Mercury are very, very, very long. Now, if you compare that to the orbital period, the orbital period is 88 days. Okay, so down here, what I said, so the orbital period, uh, the rotation is basically how long does it take the planet to rotate such that if you see a star overhead, the planet rotates and then you see that star overhead again. That is different, so that's called a sidereal day for those of you who know your basic astronomy. The other kind of day that we measure is called the solar day. And so that is basically the time from noon when the sun is overhead to the time when uh, noon happens again and the sun is overhead again. 
Now for Mercury, as you'll see down there, daily noons are 4,222.6 hours apart. Okay, that's about 175 days. So noons, the length of a day on Mercury is longer than the length of Mercury's year. And that's because of its slow rotation. So what's going on there? Well, Mercury's going around the sun, okay? And Mercury's spinning as it goes around the sun. And so the point is, is that as it spins, it's moved significantly along its orbit by such an amount that it has to spin farther before it points back to uh, the sun again. Okay, so that's the difference between sidereal days and, and solar days. Okay, so, so that has enormous consequences for the environment on Mercury. It means that there are uh, the surface of, of Mercury on any time that it's exposed to the sun is going to be exposed to the sun for tremendous amounts of time. And if you're not exposed to the sun, if you're on the night side of Mercury, then you're facing away from the sun for tremendous amounts of time. And so what that leads to is the strongest temperature variation we see of any place in the solar system. The difference between the day side and night side temperatures of Mercury is 649 degrees centigrade. It's 465 degrees in the sunlight and it's minus 184 degrees centigrade in the in the darkness. So these temperature extremes are extraordinary. And while we certainly have seen life on Earth that can experience very large extremes in temperatures, uh, we don't know of any that can quite uh, experience those kinds of temperature swings, okay? Uh, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a little bit of a problem. Now, Mercury does have a very tenuous atmosphere. That is because it is sitting so close to the sun and it's constantly being blasted uh, by that solar wind that we talked about earlier. So there is a, a little bit of a tenuous atmosphere, but it's not, it's not what you and I would call an atmosphere by any stretch of the imagination. So this is a picture, an up close picture of Mercury's surface. Um, so Mercury had, up until uh, the early 2000s, had only ever been visited by one spacecraft. Uh, Mariner 7, I think it was, and it just flew by Mercury. We had only mapped like 40% of the surface. Uh, and so it actually wasn't until the last 10 or 15 years that we've had accurate maps of the surface of Mercury, of the entire surface. Uh, there's a very large impact feature called the Chloris Basin. You can see that up there near the top of this image. Uh, Mercury, uh, much like the Earth, was uh, subject to some intense impact early on in its history. We think that's responsible for the slowness of its rotation. We think that's responsible for the the uh, very dense nature of its core. Uh, if you look on the exact opposite side of the planet from the Chloris Basin, there's something called weird terrain, where the shock waves from that impact came through the other side and kind of rippled and jumbled and cracked the surface. So uh, it's a very exotic world, okay? So given all of these things, we think the prospects for finding life on Mercury are likely very, very unlikely, okay? Okay. Venus is uh, a little bit farther out. It is often regarded as the sister world of Earth, or it's called the sister world of Earth. And that comparison comes largely from its size and largely from its math, uh, math, mass. Jeez Louise, can't talk tonight. Okay, it's mass, both of which are very similar to the Earth. Now that means if you're standing on the surface of Venus, the surface gravity is very similar to the surface gravity you would feel here on Earth. It's arguable if I transported you to Venus, if you would ever even notice uh, just based on the gravity alone. Okay, now there are some exotic things about Venus, as I'm sure most of you know. One of the things you may not know is that the rotation period of Venus is 5,832 hours long and you'll see a minus sign in the table there, that means that Venus is rotating backwards compared to the direction that most other planets rotate, which is in sync with their orbits as they go around the sun. Uh, that means, it, so it's very slow and it's also backwards, uh, so the daily noons are uh, 2,802 hours apart, that's about 116 days. So the days are very slow on Venus. So that means, just like a Mercury, if you're on the sunward side, you're exposed to the sun for long, long periods of time. If you're on the nightward side, um, you're exposed to uh, night for very long periods of time. Now, you might think that that leads you to uh, the kinds of extreme temperatures that we see on Mercury, but we don't see those temperatures on Venus at all. In fact, Venus is almost uniformly hot on every side, both day side and night side of the planet, about 464 degrees centigrade, which is as high as the temperature that we see on the day side of Mercury. So what's going on? 
Well, the atmosphere of Venus is, Venus is completely clouded over, um, and the atmosphere of Venus is almost completely carbon dioxide. It's about 96% carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a very strong greenhouse gas, and so what has happened on Venus is it has experienced a runaway greenhouse effect. That means that the temperature on Venus has slowly built up because the energy from the sun uh, filters through the clouds and gets trapped on the surface by the CO2 and can't escape. And so the temperature just soars. And so the temperature is so high on Venus that even on the night side, it can't cool down. This is like your house getting too hot during the day. And even if you open up the windows at night, it can't, it can't cool down at all, okay? So um, in addition to that uh, extreme CO2 atmosphere, uh, because it is so hot, the pressure has skyrocketed. It's about 92 times uh, the pressure that you and I experience here on Earth. Um, and the chemistry on the uh, clouds is very exotic. They are sulfuric acid clouds. So it rains sulfuric acid on Venus, and that has very dramatic impact uh, on the surface geology. So all of those conditions um, certainly uh, are, are detrimental to any form of life that you and I might imagine. Now, many probes have been sent to Venus, but the former Soviet Union is the only nation ever to land probes there. Uh, they've sent nine uh, probes to Venus that have landed uh, overall, successfully landed nine times. The longest survive uh, any of them was Venera 13, which lasted for 127 minutes before the heat, before the pressure, before the sulfuric rain killed it, okay? So this is a picture of Venera 13. So you can see the surface of Venus. Uh, the light is very heavily filtered. That's because the atmosphere is so dense and is completely clouded. So it's just like uh, the kind of muted light that we experience here on Earth on a cloudy day. You'll see that the rocks, uh, despite the fact that it looks kind of gravelly, they're all curiously smooth. There are no sharp, jagged edges. That's because the constant uh, wind that they have on Venus um, and the sulfuric rain slowly blunt out the edges of it and smooth it out, okay? Uh, so the surface of Venus is a very extreme environment. Um, the chemistry is very extreme, the temperature is very extreme, the pressure is very extreme, and so we think it's highly unlikely that life of the sort that we know would be able to survive there, okay? Okay. So I include Earth for completeness. Uh, Earth certainly uh, does harbor life, but I'll mark the prospects for life here as possible. And the reason I mark it that way is I want you to think about the Earth, not from the perspective that you know life is here, but to imagine you had to explore Earth the way we explore the other planets. Imagine you had a spacecraft that just had to fly by, or imagine you had a spacecraft that only landed in one place, okay? what would you have to do to convince yourself there was life on the planet, okay? So there are clearly places you can land on Earth and figure out there's life. If you land even in Nebraska, right, there's a wheat field you'll land in, you'll be like, oh, there's field mice and, and wheat here, okay? But if you landed, say, in the Atacama Desert, right, there are certainly places in the Atacama Desert, or if you landed in Antarctica, there are certain places you land in Antarctica where there is not a hint of life anywhere. And so that might be a situation where you uh, would not think there's life on Earth, okay? Similarly, if you fly by the Earth, if you look at Earth from spacecraft, there is virtually nothing about the planet that you can see that absolutely without fail could convince you there is life on the world. Okay, there's clearly variations that you can see in the blue marble picture there, variations in color, there's clearly an atmosphere, but there's nothing there that you can see from a photograph that would necessarily convince you there is definitely life or not. Okay, but this kind of study of Earth, the remote sensing of Earth, looking at it with pictures and studying its chemistry of its atmosphere with instruments, whatever, is a, a growing area of astrobiology. It's called the search for biosignatures, not looking for life itself, but looking for indicators of life. And the Earth is a good place to carry out our experiments to try and understand what biosignatures look like. Okay? Okay. So jumping out, uh, the next world in the solar system is Mars. And Mars has long held our um, attention uh, with regard to the search for life elsewhere. That is driven largely by our experiences with science fiction. So H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, perhaps most famously, uh, led us to consider that uh, Mars might have life. 
Uh, but the history of Mars exploration, which began telescopically, also has often speculated that there might be life on Mars. Because of all the planets in the solar system, Mars is the only one that has a surface that we can see with telescopes from Earth. And so that incites a certain kind of thinking in the human mind. And so we have all uh, long suspected that, that Mars might be a place that could harbor life. Now, as it turns out, the properties of Mars are such that that might be true. It does have a thin atmosphere. Uh, there are ices on the planet, both carbon dioxide and water ices. It has seasons, it has weather. Um, so there's lots going on on Mars that is not dissimilar from the Earth. Uh, just in the last couple of years, we've discovered uh, for the first time there are bodies of water on Mars. These are buried subglacial lakes underneath, underneath the polar caps, not unlike the lakes that we uh, find underneath the uh, ice cap in Antarctica. Uh, we don't know anything about those glacial lakes, but we know they're there. We've detected them with radar and remote sensing, so, uh, so that's uh, kind of interesting. Now, our interest in Mars as astrobiologists, as scientists looking for life, is largely driven by the fact that Mars once clearly had liquid water on its surface. So when we look at Mars from orbit, we see things like this all over the planet. If we saw these on Earth, we would say these are river valleys and alluvial deposits where running water has collected salt uh, sediments and silt and then deposited them as the water ran across the landscape. Uh, our rovers on the surface of Mars have found areas of quite uh, 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 exotic geology. So here in this uh, rock, you can see it's laid down in very thin layers. So on Earth, we call this sedimentary rock, and it's a process of deposition that we associate with water dropping materials layer after layer on top of each other and that material compressing itself into rocks, okay? So everything we see about Mars uh, is highly suggestive that it is a place where we might uh, readily search for and indeed may find uh, extraterrestrial life. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in great length. I'm just planting this here as part of the tour, uh, but we'll spend a whole, a whole couple of days talking about Mars here in a little while. Okay, so uh, we'll mark Mars as possible. Um, it's, uh, you know, you, your, your intuition may say, say it's likely, uh, but let's just call, I, I'm just going to call it possible because I don't know what likely means in this case, except in the case of Earth. Okay, so the Jovian worlds uh, are all what we call gas giant worlds. Um, as far as we know, they have no solid surfaces. Uh, they are largely hydrogen and helium atmospheres, a little bit of other stuff as well. So this is Jupiter on the top and Saturn on the bottom. You can see they have exquisite cloud structure, banding. Uh, these are associated with winds that circulate in the atmosphere constantly around the planet. Um, and then there are also storms. So Jupiter there has this famous uh, hurricane-like storm called the Great Red Spot. That Great Red Spot is about the size of two Earths right next to each other. You can just stick them right there inside the Great Red Spot. It's like a hurricane. Uh, if you look closely at the pole of Saturn there, uh, you'll see the famous hexagonal storm that uh, is constantly uh, rotating around the uh, north pole of Saturn there. Okay, so these, uh, these worlds have uh, uh, clouds. They don't have any solid surfaces. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system by far. Uh, it's quite large and quite massive. The surface gravity of Jupiter is uh, 23.1 uh, meters per second per second. So if you were at the surface of the clouds, you would experience slightly more than twice the gravity you experience here on Earth. Okay, so the astronauts who flew in the space shuttle during launch, they experienced about two and a half times gravity during launch. So that's basically what you would feel if you uh, were able to stand on the surface of Jupiter's clouds. Okay, uh, Saturn's a little bit smaller. Uh, it looks big because of the ring, but it is a little bit smaller than Jupiter, uh, a little bit less massive. Um, its surface gravity is only nine meters per second. Okay, so that's roughly what Earth is. Earth is 9.8 meters per second per second. Okay, so this is, you know, even though Saturn's enormous compared to the Earth, the surface gravity is low. That's because Saturn doesn't have that much mass in its overall density. So one of the things you often hear about Saturn is if you had a bathtub big enough and you drop Saturn in it, it would float. Its density is less than the density of water. Okay. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are a bit farther out. Uh, they also are rich in hydrogen and helium compounds. 
they are called ice giants. Um, so their uh, composition is largely the same as Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but because of the uh, overall composition that they have and the overall environment, temperature environment that they're in, uh, as the so all of these planets, as you go, go down into their interiors, uh, they get denser and those gases condense into liquids. Okay, so Jupiter has liquid hydrogen somewhere down inside of it. Uh, but we think with Uranus and Neptune, they may have liquid water mantles. And so that's a very interesting possibility because water is one of our key things that we think of uh, for the existence of life. And so um, whether or not a uh, life could survive on uh, Uranus or Neptune in one of those water mantles is an interesting question. Okay, but because these planets have no solid surfaces, they're completely by and large atmospheric planets. Uh, the interiors are supremely high pressures, uh, and the chemistry is a little bit weird because they're mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, they, the, the thought is that these planets very likely are unlikely places to find life. But exotic things like the water mantles mean that we have to think carefully about whether or not we really want to make that judgment or not. Even Jupiter, right? Uh, even Jupiter, we can't imagine there might be life, but there are certainly airborne forms of life here on Earth. And so you can cook up some existence proof of, of how life might survive in a completely gaseous atmosphere like Jupiter. And your book talks a little bit about some of these in the reading. Um, and so we can't completely um, rule out the possibility that we might find life on these worlds, okay? But we can think it's unlikely. So I'm going to label this as unlikely, but I'm going to leave it in an orange box instead of a red box uh, because of the water and, and these kinds of questions, okay? Okay, so lastly, let's talk about Pluto. So we really don't know much about Pluto, and that's because uh, we've only visited Pluto once. We had one flyby of Pluto by New Horizons in uh, just the last five years. Uh, this is one of those pictures from uh, New Horizons. We would have, before we flew by Pluto, told you is completely absurd the idea that any sort of life might survive on Pluto. But we discovered some interesting things about Pluto when we flew by. In particular, if you look at the surface there of Pluto, uh, there's a few impact craters, like there are on Mars, like there are on Earth, but there aren't very many impact craters at all. And that's really weird, because we would expect uh, Pluto to be a lot like the surface of Mercury, or a lot like the surface of the Moon, where impact craters are formed and then they stay put. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is Pluto almost certainly has been bombarded. That's why there are craters on its surface now. But somehow those craters have been erased, okay? And in particular, if you look at the famous heart-shaped region there, okay, so that uh, kind of pale pink region there on the lower right, that's called Sputnik Planum. So that is a region of virtually absolutely smooth ice on the surface of Pluto. Okay, uh, it's nitrogen ices and, and stuff like that. It's not, there's not very much water ice, but it's uh, volatile so ices at all. But it's smooth. And what that means is it's very recently deposited there. So somehow, in a way that we don't understand, we don't actually know what the source is, there is an energy source on Pluto that is able to melt the ices, turn them to liquids, uh, we think it's very likely there are geysers, both water geysers and other exotic geysers from all these other ices on Pluto, and that those geologic processes, driven by whatever that unknown energy source is, are responsible for the resurfacing of Pluto. Okay, so if there is a source of energy on Pluto, and if there is uh, water, possibly liquid water, maybe a subsurface ocean, who knows, right? Then you and I have to ask the question, could life tap into that energy? Because we've certainly seen life tap into that energy here on Earth in very exotic environments. Okay, so this is probably my favorite picture that was taken during the Pluto flyby. This is looking back at Pluto with the sun illuminating it from behind, and you can see the structure in the layers of Pluto's atmosphere. So Pluto's atmosphere is a very uh, volatile uh, thing. Uh, when Pluto is close to the sun, that atmosphere evaporates from the surface ices and fills out. But we think as Pluto gets farther around in its orbit and starts to get farther away from the sun, the atmosphere is going to freeze out 
and collapse back to the surface and then it will um, become exposed again uh, when it gets close to the sun during its next Plutonian year. Okay, so it does have an atmosphere. It's tenuous. It's not nearly as tenuous as Mercury's. It's actually pretty thick by comparison, uh, but it is as a consequence of those ices, those volatiles that we see on the surface of Pluto. Okay, so I'm going to label Pluto as red. I think most astrobiologists would label Pluto as red uh, because it's pretty extreme. It's pretty cold, but these uncertainties, these new uncertainties we have, um, about uh, the energy source on Pluto, what's driving the geology, what's driving the resurfacing, uh, give me pause, okay? And so even though I've labeled the box red, I'm gonna write unlikely as opposed to not likely um, because um, I, just, I just don't know what we really should think, okay? Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say for the grand tour, okay? So that is all the planets. Okay, uh, there have been a couple of places, Mars in particular, where we think we might look for life. Uh, there are places where definitely we don't think we, we can look for life, uh, Venus, for instance, uh, and then other places where maybe, you know, we don't want to rule out something where something exotic might happen, uh, the mantles of the ice giants or Pluto, who knows what. Okay, so the solar system is a big place. There's lots of places where life could hide and adapt. Uh, we'll talk about some more of that uh, for next lecture when we talk about some of the moons. So many of the moons around the Jovian worlds uh, in particular are very likely places where we might harbor life, as are some of the dwarf planets in the asteroid belt. So we'll talk about those next lecture, and that'll complete our survey of the possible life uh, locations here in the solar system. Okay, so I hope you're all safe and well. Take care of yourself, and we'll talk to you soon.